So you guys just shot a video for Lost Kitten. We did. Like a week ago. Uh huh. Tell me, tell me about this. What was that like? Well, I have to tell you, my favorite thing is not being in videos. Um, I think it's kind of a strange medium, to be honest. And we're sort of in a, it's a time that's interesting because of all the online viewage, you know, viewing you can get viewage, the online viewage. Yeah. Uh, it's a whole other world for short film, for really great directors and people who want to do things that are outside the confines of like, you know, look hot and lean on a car, you know, which I've actually, I walked around a car in Youth Without Youth video. Yeah. I actually like that it, video. I think it got cut though, didn't it? Did it? Yeah, maybe. I think it was just my leg or something. Maybe. But I, for a minute it was like hot car shot. <laughs> um, I think we were like, Emily's leg makes that car look fat, so let's get it out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but so the Lost Kitten video, we're really excited because we're working with um, this director called Sammy Rowell. He's a, a Canadian director and um, a production company called Believe that's out of New York. And uh, it's a really, really cool thing they did. Um, I don't want to give too much away, but they went and shot in, in Mexico. And they're exploring all sorts of interesting um, mythological meanings of the search for, your, for the mother, for, the, for, the, for this sort of spiritual uh, self that we're all kind of missing. And the protagonist is a highly unusual um, protagonist for what you would probably visualize. I've been sending out some little sneak peeks of it, and people are really freaking out that the, the protagonist is not actually a kitten. Um, but then I just send them to that cat that's running for mayor in Mexico. I don't know if you saw that. I was just like, there's always more as the cat that's running for mayor. It's, you know. um, but I don't want to give too much away. But yes, yeah, so it's, I'm really excited uh, to see the great work of Sammy and his whole team. It's going to be trying beautiful. to sound like a kitten in that song? Like, I feel like you're yeah. trying to do like the cutest voice possible. I know, I know. Well, it's, a very, it's funny. That's a song that evolved over a long time. I started that in Buenos Aires actually before Fantasies. And it was... It was this sort of like, yeah, if like a kitten could rap or something. I don't know what the hell it is. And the storyline is highly, I don't know. A lot of times when I'm writing things, I think I'm, it's a lot of subconscious stuff. In that case of, you know, cultural expectations of girls or something about that of like, you know, kitten on the catwalk, high heeled shoes and like, you know, victim of the system, say it isn't so, you know. And this sort of sympathy you feel sometimes for young women, you're just like, do you want to be doing that, you know? Um, so, but in the end, hopefully it's just a great jam that people enjoy, so. Speaking of great jams, you guys just played three great jams. You guys want to talk about writing one of those? Any, any three, I'll let you guys choose which one. Let's see. Uh, well, the, I mean, the middle song, Synthetica, was, uh, it turned into like this thing. It was, at some point, we, we have this board in the, in the studio, which is like, you know, just like soundproofing stuff that you can pin stuff up on. And we had all, we have all these ideas up on the board when we were making that record in particular. And there were everything from like, you know, a chord change to a lyric to a song title to, you know, a, a visualization like, or a theme. Yeah, sure. Or anything like that was like an Tokyo. inspiration, you know. <laughs> and um, so we had this song that started out actually as Little Tokyo. And then it, sort of kept evolving and every single time I would go to an instrument I'd be like oh I'm writing a new song and it'd be the exact same chords <laughs> the exact same tempo the same melody and then Emily would be like you, writ you wrote that like nine times in a row you realize that <laughs> so and every time it would have sort of one extra little section and then one night we sat in the studio and we were like what? I wonder if all of these things are going to come together to make this one big piece of music so we we went over to the other board and we put this word void right in the middle of this huge thing. It was the only thing over there and it was like the all ominous sort of overseeing sound of the whole record. And uh, eventually it got sort of whittled and whittled down. Yeah, I mean, it was like, like 45 minutes of music or something that we was. managed to make into Synthetica. And it was one of the last ones we finished because yeah. I struggled with the... Now, now the lyrics flow really... They make, some, they make sense. I hope they make sense to you. But I feel like it's one of the more clear lyrical songs. But uh, I struggled with that bridge. I struggled with little parts, um, really passionately, like fought for, my, for the things I wanted to say. And a lot of um, what's interesting in our process is with, with Jimmy and I, with writing together, is you know, anyone who knows my solo material, you know, I also like to write sort of abstract, more ethereal stuff that's not necessarily like clear what the hell I'm talking about, but you get a feeling. Um, but so a lot of with Metric, what we've been working on is being like, no, I kind of want to know what you're actually saying. I want to feel, at least emotionally, feel connected with what you're saying. So there's been a lot of me, you know, and in that song, I'd like have all these lyrics, and Jimmy would be like, totally, have no idea what you're talking about. And I'd be like, damn, if you don't know, and you've been playing music with me for 15 years, someone who's just, you know, checking out the jam, what are they going to, they're going to be like, what now? Um, so it was, it's been a really amazing process of just clarifying Really, what are you trying to say? I mean, you can get away with a lot of ambiguity lyrically, but uh, you know, my dad was a writer, so he was very serious about 
the value of each word and sort of austere use of language. So it's a good challenge. It's the direction I'm going with my writing. I was, I was watching uh, the interview with Gion yesterday, preparing for this, and, and you oh, mentioned cool, your father. Yeah. And, uh, and I was wondering, have you ever thought about taking some of his words and putting them into tombs? Like, have you they, used his lyrics before? I actually have, and it's happened in a really beautiful, almost like my father's passed away, um, in a sort of beautiful, ghostly way. An example is the song Dream So Real from Synthetica. Um, he has a poem, um, which I'm actually going to read for you from my mind and heart. <laughs> it's, it's a really good example of his writing, which is... Uh, Dreams so real, uh, we, we wake up in them, remembering none of them. An odd woe stirring us so. You know, it's lovely. It's almost like a haiku or something. So with that song, I really struggled for a title for a long time. It was called The Song That Has No Name. And people that you care about us were just like, guys, you can't, it, no, the song, that, that's not I fair love, to the song. I loved that title. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was I'm, awesome. I'm glad it became Dream So Real. Yeah, it's, it's a great It connected too. with, you know, and thematically that song is sort of looking at that question of like, I don't know, I've been doing this my whole life. I give everything to it. I hope I'm making a difference. But in the end, you're just kind of like, you realize you're just this little thing on the radio and you're just such a peripheral part of culture, you know, in a way. And it's like, maybe I should be doing something completely else where I could genuinely help people because I don't know. Well, you're doing that with the necklace, aren't you? What did I read? Oh, that's cool. Sleep yeah. for Hear Me. What is this? <clears throat> that's, a, that's a cool project. I'm, I have a friend who's a really amazing designer of jewelry and other things. And she's... Uh, from Vancouver, and um, she started a company called Fleet, and she came up with this idea of doing a collaboration with this really amazing organization called Hear Me, that finds a way to get equipment into uh, schools, orphanages, places where kids have no way of getting just an instrument under their hands, or in, and no way of capturing anything they might write. You know, which for me has been a, such a blessing, just to record it. You know, my dad always said, whatever it is, you're just playing the piano, just record it. You know, just give yourself that opportunity. So, she did a. a collaboration with them and we designed this um, I wish I was wearing one it's a pendant it's a pen it looks just like kind of a cool necklace but when you open it up there's a pen uh, in there and it says um, uh, believe in the power of songs which is a line from dream so real so yeah it's a nice thing to be part of and it's a little a very small contribution to one thing but it helps. It's, it's better than nothing it's kind so of believe in the power of songs I was gonna ask yeah. you guys uh, for each of you from either a musician's point of view or as a listener where has the power of song brought you I know. Manifest destiny, well, man. this morning it brought us to a bunch of airports. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. and, and you're leaving one an hour to take you to Niagara to play yeah, another yeah, show. Yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. I mean, it's brought us everywhere <laughs> we've ever gone. You know, it's, I, I, I think in the beginning we had a, a ridiculously naive sense of where a song could take you. And I'm pretty sure we still maybe have a ridiculously naive sense of where songs can take us. Because it keeps actually happening. Like, a really good example of, of it to me is Stadium Love, which, mm -hmm. you know, and Fantasies was so well received it was such a breakthrough album for us but maybe some of you guys know the many years we spent before that you know it's like with Live It Out and Old World Underground and um, so Stadium Love was such a sort of dream it was just like yeah imagine like a stadium I mean we were playing in clubs when we wrote that song and then throughout the life of that album somehow we manifested this thing of where it, because of the song itself in order to you know properly present it live it was like yeah we should be really need to up the production and it sort of was a visualization like a sonic expression of where we wanted to go and then we found ourselves at the end of that cycle like playing with muse you know like in a normo dorm dome in in uh, the new jersey dome. the normo dome yeah. you know in, uh, in New Jersey with like a, a, the, when the cops gave us the escort out, I was just like, stadium love, wow, you know? <laughs> As opposed to my tendency would be to write songs that are just like, this is what's wrong, this is what's bad, this is probably gonna be this bad forever, you know? And then you start to realize, is that gonna take me? You know, well, do we, I wanna live with that? We started realizing at some point that, you know, especially lyrically, you're, you're, you're saying, you're repeating stuff every single night yeah, and you're mantra. saying it like with passion. So you, you should be careful what you're saying because you're gonna end up living whatever, you know, you're preaching and teaching and, and, and uh, you know, repeating on a daily basis. So it's, we started realizing that maybe, you know, what we were writing would actually sort of start to change the path of what was happening externally as well. And I think that was a powerful realization. Yeah, and Help I'm Alive was a big one for that too, for me, because I would just be, you know, it's, I'm, it's just so nerve wracking to play, get in front of people. And like, it, you know, especially in this time, you put yourself so out there and it's kind of anyone can throw anything at you verbally or you know, beer bottles or whatever. Twitter it's, balls. It's, Twitter <laughs> balls, yeah. It's a really intense existence. And I had struggled so much with just exactly the feeling of that song of like, you know, I tremble, they're gonna eat me alive. Like, 
and then sort of the really just was honest about how scared I was every time I stood up on stage. But suddenly I had a song that instead of fighting it or doing like a lot of sort of you know, operation compensation, as we used to call it, of just like, I'm gonna just like run around up here and nobody will notice me. It's like, it's not really <laughs> working, but so, was, you know, this a way to express it, that I could own it. And then the chorus of that song is sort of a like, it's like your own cheerleader being like, if you're still alive, our, my regrets are few, you know, it's like, you can do this, it's okay. And it really resonated with other people, I think, in the same way. So that was a good example of, of the power of songs too. That's, I was just thinking that you guys have to go to Niagara soon. And I do want to get some of these fan questions in. Cool, yeah, please. Um, Audrey Lee, what's your favorite song to play on tour and why? 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 Um, we actually answered this one the other day, and it's, it's funny because the, someone asked the question, what's, the song, what's the, your favorite song to play on tour? Or what's a song that just the set doesn't feel complete unless you play? Oh, yeah. And we sort of latched onto the second half of that because you know, we realized recently we've, we've actually never played a, a show without playing Dead Disco, not one. Mm. And it, it, It's a song from Old World Underground, which is 2003. We've tried. I believe you sent me a actual CD to my college radio station back in the day. Is that right? right. You guys used to mail them, right? Yeah, 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 I used to put them in the envelope, and yeah, that's cool. And uh, strangely, the song has become, you know, internally our our biggest point of expression because it's we've been playing it for so long it's so free we feel like we can do whatever we want to do within it and it's taken us to so many different weird and awesome musical places where you know we walk off stage and it's 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 become the thing that will guide us forward into the next musical direction it's just this like you know our oldest child in a yeah. sense you know the like the pimply teenager of yeah. all of our songs yeah and breathing underwater is just like a pristine little baby and yeah that just goes like, Rrr. Does right. it fit better beside other songs in the set? Like, does it need to live in a certain place at the beginning, at the end? It usually lives at the end. Near the okay. end. It's hard to start the, the <laughs> set with, like, a 12-minute jam. We did that at that, <laughs> at that really horrible place in Milwaukee once. Yeah, we played this place called The Rave in Milwaukee that's, oh. like, it's bad. It was just, it was, it was right across from where Jeffrey Dahmer L- lived, lived, like, seriously. No, and, and all the crew were like, hey, did you see Dahmer's place? I was just it's like, like no. oh, God. I, and then it was down in the basement, and then it was like they, they would shoot horror movies down there. Like, they'd fill it with water and shoot horror movies. It was just like, ah! It was really Everyone gnarly. hated us. We just played Dead Disco for like 15 minutes and then we ran away. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That kind of leads into Kristen Turco's question. Uh, what is the thought process behind choosing which older songs to include in a set? Well, simply, it's the ones that we still know how to play. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> well, we've been talking about that a lot lately as well because, you know, you have to sort of go into, um, when you're out on the road, it's a pretty big production. We get a lot of people, you know, five people crew, and there's big trucks, and you, so sometimes you're going into a festival setting where it's an hour, and you just, there's just no room for, like, and now, you know, track eight from album one. It's just not effective. So a lot of the last few years have been to really try to curate for people who are maybe new to the band, like, the most impactful sort of collection of our past material but I think we're hoping in the fall to uh, open it up more and play some of the other other ones like Ending Start and you know IOU from Old World we haven't played in so long and it's mm-hmm. kind of it's cool Hustle Rose we've played a bit that's one of the ones she asked for oh is that IOU. oh really yeah. I think that one's going to come back I think so it, it's just kind of you, you know there's just it's a it's a big production to keep everything going and find the time and so I think uh, it'd be nice for us to Musically, too. To we we, some we ran into the producer from Old World Underground on the street in New York two days ago. So weird. And His name's Michael Andrews. He did yeah. the Donnie Darko soundtrack. And a bunch of soundtracks since then. Yeah. But, uh, he discovered us at the Silver Lake Lounge in L.A. There were, like, an person there. We were talking about, <laughs> about that song. He still he uses the word radical all the time. Like, not rad. He actually says, radical, man. And, <laughs> He's awesome. Uh, we were talking about that song, and it just kind of came up. And I think it occurred to both me and Emily. Like, it's come up in the past, but then running into him, and he's got a big beard, something about the beard. Beard and the Made radical more and talking about how you would always just like it's working, yeah. we gotta do this song. Yeah, it's cool, it'll come back. You alluded to playing shows in the fall. So last time we saw you was the ACC here in November. Yeah. So another tour possibly yeah, we're still kind putting of thing. It together, you okay. know? And trying the, I think the big thing we're trying to do is you you know, you work so hard to get this thing up off the ground and we're so happy that we do, but then you have to make sure you don't just repeat yourself, you know? So it's multifaceted. Mm-hmm. It's like everyone in their work and their life. Like you accomplish something and you're like, okay, good, but then you don't just go like, yep. You know, it doesn't really get you anywhere. So we have to look at, you know, other sides of our musical ability. What do we want to make sure we keep developing and don't, you don't want to become like, I'm the girl who goes like this and sings Stadium Love, you know? I love that I can rock the faces off of 10,000 people, but I also like playing small clubs and, you know, I really All like All the doing, things in between. It's weird. Yeah. Playing the ACC for us was very much like, 
wow, we set out to just do something. It's the beginning of this band, and and that was it. And uh, it, I think it opened up an opportunity to re-envision what might be in the future. Yeah, like all sorts of possibilities of sonic things and different collaborations. I don't think I've totally come up with the answer for that yet, but I like the question. Yeah. No, we talked about it in November, too, and I think yeah. you guys are still trying to figure it out. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I got to well, let you guys go. Well, nothing's happened since then. No, yeah, nothing. <laughs> no, only a couple, Sitting three Sitting around Junos. just going like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so last time we did five questions, it was it was interesting. We're gonna see if this works again. Uh -oh. I think you you, you figured out how to crack the, the code last round. time. Exactly. But do you remember how you figured it out last time? What? No. What? Okay. Well, then we'll see oh, if this God. happens. Road or studio? Studio right now. <laughs> yeah, studio right now. Lennon or McCartney? Don't do this oh. to me, <laughs> Ringo. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. James. Well, you just have to say George Harrison. Well, you said the read last time. Harrison. Oh, did I? Yeah. Uh, when you hear a song, what usually hits you first? Lyrics, melody, or rhythm? Rhythm. Uh, I think it's melody for me, probably. Song you've written you're most proud of? I Aw. I gotta say, I mean, Artificial Nocturne's kind of like, yeah. Yeah, I did. Mm. Yeah, I started the record like that. Yeah, I was you gonna say, that's I mean? why I started? Okay. Yeah. Oh, maybe Hustle Rose. Yeah, that's a good one. That's what you said last time. Yeah. In one word, metric. Love, Met man. Yeah, family. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank metric. you. Metric! <laughs>